Um, just before we dig in, I want to look this morning at Job and at Genesis. On Thursday, we flipped back to the book of Genesis. That will actually happen a few times this year where we're in the middle of the week, we end a book and we go back to it and start a new book. Um, we'll do that a few times. And this week, I think it really fits together well. And so we're going to do that. But um, before I, I start, I just want to say, uh, if you don't have a Bible in your hand, it will really help you as we flip around and look at some things. There are lots of them at the back there. If you want to feel free to go and grab one. Uh, the other thing, as I say pretty much every week, if you're with us here in grade 9 or 10 or under, and you take notes while I'm talking, then come and show them to me later, and I have some Smarties and some other stuff that I will gladly give you for doing that. Let's pray together, and let's invite God's presence here and ask Him to do the teaching um, as we look at His Word this morning. Our Father in heaven, uh, we have gathered here to worship you and to hear from you. And now as we, as we open your word, God, I pray that you would make it come alive to us. Help us to see things and understand things maybe we haven't before. But most of all, help us to see you and see your character and see your love. God, we can put ourselves in, in, in right perspective that way when we see you and when we know ourselves. God, help us to see you, your love, and your grace this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So how are you doing in your reading so far? Are you keeping up? I think I said last time, if you, if you haven't kept up or if you've missed a few days, don't try to catch up. Just jump in where we are again. If you're starting now, uh, just, just jump right in where we are. All of the info is on the website. There are some paper things over there with schedules for the reading and those kind of things. And I think for most of us, it's uh, somewhere between uh, 15 and 25 minutes a day. Uh, it seems to be what I'm hearing for most people. Do you know, have you seen, if, I don't know if you've been out in the Rocky Mountains, um, when the sun rises and you get a glimpse of the mountains on the horizon, how they turn this bright, luminant, golden color. We see, you see that here in this part of the world in different ways. But as the sun rises, as the light changes and the shadows move and the colors change, um, I love living here and seeing the sunsets absolutely different every day. And maybe even best when it's been a stormy day. It seems to always, right as the sun is setting, it just cracks apart and the sun beams through. And the colors and the clouds uh, are spectacular. Um, to think about how after a crazy, blustery, windy day, when it calms, how calm that is. And how peaceful that is. You think of the power in the waves, and, a, and how after a storm, maybe even the whole shoreline just looks differently because of the power in the waves. And, and we, we've seen this as we've read this week in the end of the book of Job. We've seen these things, and actually each of those things God talked about there. But we also see um, how, how God commands the dawn every morning. For the sun to rise and the sun to set, and he is the source of those lights. In Genesis, or in Job chapter 38, verse 18, he says, Do you realize the extent of the earth? In that chapter, he talks about the snow and the hail and the fire and the rivers and the mountains and the plains and the lightning and the ice and how he measured it all out with, with his surveying line. There's a great little verse in there when he says to Job, Do you know the laws of the universe? The cycles of the stars and the moon and the planets? And you, you can control the world, the earth, by the laws of the universe, right? We see this over and over in these chapters. And um, if nothing else, I walk away with just the awestruck feeling of how amazing God is. How awesome, how powerful God is. And that's in, in if you have your Bibles, in Job uh, 
chapter 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. It's just on and verse after verse after verse of how awesome, how powerful God is. So let me ask you, when you read that, how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? Uh, I am humbled. And I love if you're listening to the podcast, how, how in this context, she talked about the difference between shame and humility. Because shame is, is a wrong picture. It's a selfish picture. And humility is a proper picture in perspective of everything, of who I am. But this awesome, awesome God, and I am humbled. We see the power, the control, the creation, the initiating and sustaining of everything. And what a great picture as we read that to go back, as Lisa said, to Genesis chapter 1. And all it says is God created the animals, each according to their own kind. But go here, as he talks about the goats and the lions and the other beasts and the animals, uh, so much more detail and picture to what's happening in Genesis chapter 1. So, in Job, 36 chapters, basically, of Job saying the same thing over and over and over. I want to just sit down and talk with God. So he hears me, and then he can answer me. He says that so much. Uh, but you can feel, at the end of Job, you can feel the complete change in Job's demeanor when all of a sudden God starts talking. And there's twice... Uh, that he says in, in chapter 40, verse 3, he says, I am nothing. How could I ever find answers? I actually, I cover my mouth because I've already said too much. And then in chapter 42, uh, in verse 6, he says, I take back everything I said. Because he's humbled. He's realizing himself in light of God and putting that in proper perspective. So I believe Job was a real person. And I know lots of people don't. I believe he was a real person. He lived somewhere between Noah and Abraham from the book of Genesis. This is why chronologically as we read through, we jumped to Job, and now we come back to Genesis. Uh, but there's about 2,000 years there between Noah and Abraham. And, but I, I, I think the book of Job was written either afterwards or certainly after all of this happened. We don't have the exact words these people say because it's, it's the story of Job written afterwards and it, the whole thing is written as poetry. And as you read it, you can see that. It's, it's, it's just all poetry and it's telling the story of Job so that we'd have it throughout all of history. After chapters of challenging God's methods and God's control, now we begin to see the truth about God. So what do we see? In this last three or four chapters, God is awesome. Now, awesome is a word I don't even want to use here because we throw that word around all the time. So if you look up synonyms for the word awesome, none of them even do this justice. We think of overwhelming and grand or breathtaking or tremendous, remarkable, amazing, awe-inspiring, astounding, humbling, obviously out of this world. None of those words do justice to this if you read through these chapters. Now, I used to think as I read through these that God was angry and, and that this was a picture. You could see God with a red face and smoke coming to ears and he's, where were you when I created the world? Where were you? Were you there? It's not like that at all. And I think this time reading through it with, with a whole different perspective, it really came into light in light of the last few verses where, where God actually deals with Job with real tenderness. And instead of God being angry and pointing his finger and, and, and almost yelling these chapters, I really picture it as if it's a dad with his five-year-old son on his lap saying, surely you were there when I created the rivers. You know how this works. I love the one, you know the laws of the universe. And you can control the world by it, right? But it's, it's a gentle, it's a calming, it's a conversation. And God is pointing out uh, who he really is. And we know that because we get to the end of it. And God doesn't just all of a sudden turn off his anger and be gentle and kind and, gent and, and caring. 
There's not shame. There's just humility. And I feel humbled when I read this. God is God. Who am I to question him? It really gives a proper perspective and a reverence. If it was shame, it would be the desire to read this and I want to run away and hide. It's not like that. I love this last paragraph in the book of Job because God comes down and in the end he says Job was right, his friends were wrong, and if you're like me, the first thing I'm expecting to see is they both get what they deserve. Job will be rewarded, the friends will be chastised, and they'll get what they deserve. And if you were here last week, I talked about that a little bit. It's got nothing to do with what you deserve. That's not how God has set up the world. And, and, and as I tried to explain that last week, obviously I didn't do a really great job um, explaining that because I got lots of questions that were, um, that, that showed me I didn't, people didn't really understand what I was trying to say. God has not set the world up on a karma system. It's not about what you deserve. You don't deserve bad things. Nobody deserves good things. It's not based on that. And I think that's an important thing. And if in the end of Job, we see this right away as God starts telling these three friends how they've misrepresented him, how they did, uh, acted poorly. And he says in verse 8, and if you underline in your Bible and circle things or highlight things, these words in chapter 42, verse 8, I will not treat you as you deserve. That is a huge statement from cover to cover in our scripture. I will not treat you as you deserve. No one goes to heaven or hell because you deserve it. Nobody goes to the good place because they're good and the bad place because they're bad. That's not how it works. Here we see that God restores Job's fortune and, and his life not because he deserves it, but because God is blessing him. The three friends bring their sacrifice. I love it when he says, bring your sacrifice and Job will pray for you. I, I, just, I, that just, I almost wanted to stand up and cheer. But you know what? What does God do here? Despite what anybody deserves, he restores them all. He restores their friendship. He restores their relationship with him. He restores their lives. That's worth way more than he says here. Uh, Job had 6,000 camels. To have his friends in good relationship again after all of that, that's worth way more than that. And then he's allowed to pray for his friends and accept and give forgiveness and their relationships were restored. That's powerful. That, that's humbling and meaningful all at the same time. And all of them knew God in a whole new way. So we talked about that last week, about deserving, and whether Job deserved the grief or not. Job didn't deserve anything. He didn't deserve restoration. God just poured out his blessing. As I said, his friends didn't deserve uh, to be restored either. God just poured out his forgiveness and grace. As I said, nobody deserves to go to the good place or the bad place or heaven or hell because of what we've done. Nobody deserves bad things to happen or good things to happen because of what we've done. That's not how God has set up the world. Every single one of us has fallen short of God's expectation. Every one of us. So if we want to talk about deserving, no matter who we are on earth, could be the best person in the world. We have fallen short of what God expects. And so in that sense, if we deserve anything, we, need, we deserve death, spiritual death and separation from God. But that's not what God has done. The only reason that we can be forever in the presence of God is because of Jesus. No matter who we are, good or bad, we get to heaven and we're on judgment day. The only reason that we can spend eternity with God is because Jesus says, I got this one. There is no other reason. 
So I want you to understand that has nothing to do with what we deserve. Today, to be forgiven for sin and have a place as a child as God is not because we deserve it, because we don't. None of that matters. Here's what does matter. This awesome God, mind-blowing God, is completely aware of every detail in your life. Every detail in your life, the good stuff and the bad stuff, and he cares, and he wants to be involved, and he wants to give you peace and comfort and hope in healing. This God, this powerful, awesome, all-powerful creator God who created everything and sustains everything wants to be intimately involved in your life. He cares, and he's personal, and he's watching, and he's engaged, and he's so full of grace. He sees, and he knows, and he's involved. You still got your Bible? Turn to Job chapter 38. This huge and powerful God, sovereign over everything, but so intimate and caring and personal. So let's take that. That's the end of the book of Job. Let's take that, that all-powerful God that's omnipotent, the all-knowing God, omniscient, the God that's everywhere, omnipresent, the God that's the creator and keeper and source of everything. He made all the rules and systems and, and times and seasons. He made all the creatures from the smallest uh, micro bug to the most powerful beast. They're all under his control. Take that, that powerful God, that is so intimate at the end of this book. And now let's go to Genesis, where we went on Thursday, if you're doing the reading. On Thursday, we jumped back into Genesis, in Genesis chapter 12. And I want us to see, if nothing else today, that this powerful God, this awesome God of the universe, loving and caring and engaging and personal, is just the same with the life of Abraham. This awesome God, you know that the ancient Hebrews were not even allowed to say his name. They were not allowed to write his name. And so when you look in your Bible and you see the, the word Lord when it's all caps, that's there because that in, in, in their, when they're writing it, that should be the name of God. And they're not allowed to write it. So they wrote the word Lord in all caps. This God so respected and, and awesome is loving and caring and personal and watching and engaged. And we see this a whole bunch of times. Uh, this week we read from Genesis 12 to 24. And we see it all the way through here. We see how God in chapter 12 initiates a relationship with Abraham. Out of the blue, we don't know anything about Abraham. We have no reason. He doesn't say like with Job, have you seen my servant Job, how great he is and how righteous he is and how obedient he is and faithful he is. We don't have any of that for Abraham. It's just God comes to Abraham out of the blue and says, I will make you great. I will bless you. Uh, I will make a whole nation from your line. All families of the earth will be blessed by you and your descendants. And God calls him to the land that he's promised him. Right away, Abraham screws up. They go to Egypt, and he says his wife is his sister because he's terrified. And we see that actually uh, in the next little bit in Genesis. We see this over and over and over that people are doing this, and it makes no sense. Please don't believe, and I think in the podcast she says this, there are so many times in the next week of your reading that we see this twisted, crazy, manipulative, sneaky, uh, lying behavior. And it's not okay. I think the words that, that Terry Lee Cobble used in the podcast is, this is descriptive, not prescriptive. This is describing what they did. But because you can't say, well, because the Bible says this, this is okay to do. Uh-uh. It's describing what they did. And a lot of it is not okay and twisted. And it seems for the next 10 or 12 chapters, it just continues to go on and on. There's lots of things. And I hope as we read them, they stand out to you as not okay. But even in these chapters, we continue to see God's caring and watching and engaged and personal side. 
In chapter 16, Hagar, the slave, who is impregnated um, by Abraham because Sarah, his wife, couldn't have babies. Uh, we see actually that behavior happen a whole bunch of times coming up to, and it's not okay. But, but she's chased away. And we see this loving, caring God that goes to her and restores her. Uh, we see in chapter 18, uh, it says God hears Sarah's prayer. And she has this baby at 90 years old. We see in chapter 17, uh, as God says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm going to do? God's including him and initiating including him into the relationship. And then they have this, this crazy conversation in prayer where God actually allows Abraham to set the limits of what God's going to do. This awesome, powerful, all-powerful, all-knowing God, the creator of everything, is right there personally and caring. And in ch chapter 21, we come back to Hagar again, and her, her and her son Ishmael are chased away again and, and uh, at the end and ready to die, and God comes and visits them again. They're not even his people, and yet he comes and chases them and confirms a promise to them. We get into chapter 22, and we have this crazy story about God asking uh, Abraham to offer his son as a sacrifice. And we know God is not okay with child sacrifice. This story is not about Isaac. This story is about Abraham and his obedience. And, and, and the whole point in that story comes to the end where God is providing for Abraham. So as hard as it is sometimes to do what God is asking, God will provide. That's the whole point of that. We see this caring again. Side note, I love uh, that you will see, if you haven't read it, I think it was yesterday, Uz and Buzz are real names, okay? So it's okay to name your, na your son Buzz. Chapter 24, I love this story, um, where Abraham's uh, servant goes to travel to find Isaac a wife. And this is a servant, and he gets there, and the first thing he does is stop and pray. And God answers him, and he stops and praises God. This is the servant. And I can't help but think, if I had somebody living in my house, a foreign exchange student or someone like that, how long would it take before my faith rubbed off on them in a way that that dominated their life? Because Abraham's faith, his relationship with God was contagious, that even his servants followed. And I wonder how, how often or, or how our love for God, how our behavior is contagious to the people around us. So I hope you're listening to the podcast because there's lots of these things. I probably spent way too much time talking about that stuff. But lots of these things that I, we, could, we could spend two months in these 12 chapters of Genesis. There's so much happening here. Um, but, but we won't get into some of those things. And Melchizedek is a whole month worth of sermons there. Uh, I'm not going to get into that today. If you've read that and you have questions about that, we will come to that when we come to Hebrews in November because there's about six chapters in the book of Hebrews that's all about this one little bit in Genesis and Melchizedek. If you want to work ahead, you can do some of that kind of stuff. But I want to stick with this, and I know my time's almost up. The big, powerful God is close and personal and caring. If you have your Bible there, then look at um, chapter 15. I'm going to cut ahead in my notes here because I'm already way off. In chapter 15, well, I'll read a couple of verses, starting at verse 9. God's talking to Abraham. He says, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And so Abraham presented all of these to him, and he killed them, and he cut each animal down the middle and laid the halves side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. And some vultures swooped down to eat the carcasses, but Abraham chased them away. As soon as God asked him to do this, Abraham knew exactly what this was. This was how uh, a, a king would ratify an oath with the lesser king. 
or, or a king with a peasant, or, a, or, or a, a, slave, a master with a slave. If they were making an oath together, this is what they would do. They would get these animals, they would uh, separate it and lay it down like a gauntlet. And then what would happen is they would walk down the middle. And that would be saying, if I don't keep my end of the bargain on this oath, then may what happened to these animals happen to me. Does that make sense? You see that? And so his, as soon as Abraham knew what God is asking him to do, he would have known that this was about an oath and that you're bound to this. And so um, God, in, in verses 12 to 16, goes back over the promise again. And then it comes to verse 17. He says, When the sun went down and darkness fell... Abraham saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. Now, isn't that weird? The flaming pot and the, and the flaming torch and the smoking fire pot, those words there, I think Terry Lee Cobble talked about this in the podcast, those words there are used several other times in the Bible. And Mount Sinai, when, when Moses was up there getting the, the Ten Commandments and the, the mountain shook and there was fire and there was smoke, it's exactly those same words. When the people of Israel were walking through the wilderness and they said, uh, it says there was a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud during the day that led them, exactly the same words. What this is, this is the presence of God. So here's the situation. You can see this. They made this gauntlet of these animals that have been sacrificed. And, and, mo and, and what happens is God himself comes and walks down between them. Now, this is really, really strange. This would not have happened. And this would be bewildering to Abraham. Because the way it would work historically, it, it, it was always a, a greater, more powerful, and a lesser that they would do this in this kind of oath. And so if a king was making an oath, oath with a lesser king, or a king with a peasant, or a master with a slave, only the lesser would walk through. So if it's a king and a lesser king, or a really powerful king and a smaller king, then only the lesser one would walk through, not the powerful one. Because the powerful one then holds all the cards and all the power, and if the, if the oath is broken, it's the lesser one that always paid for it. Does that make sense? If it was a master and a slave, and they made an oath together, the slave alone would walk through that saying, if this covenant breaks down, if this oath breaks down, I die. That's what this says. But you see what happens here? Sometimes, historically, the master and the slave or the kings might walk through together, which would say, if you break it, you die. If you break it, you die. But what does God do? This God, this all-powerful creator God, comes down and makes this oath with Abraham, and then only God goes through. What does that say? God is saying, if I break the, 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 the deal here, my, my covenant with you, if I break that, then I die. I will be like these animals in separation. But he goes beyond that because he says, Abraham, if you mess this up, I will die. Think about that. This is the God of the universe. Abraham had no idea that one day this would happen. Abraham had no idea the cost that God was putting into uh, this, this covenant God's promise with this oath is, I will be your God. You will be my people. And I will bring salvation to the earth. But what happened centuries later? Mark chapter 15, in a dark and broken world, darkness came over the world and Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus was killed and separated, for this covenant. Abraham had no idea what it would cost, no idea that it would cost God to fulfill this. In Isaiah chapter 
53, we read that he was cut off, stricken for the transgressions of my people. Do you see how amazing this is? Do you see how beautiful this is? Do you see how unusual that is? It's absolutely opposite, opposite to everything normal. And if you know the rest of your Bible enough, you'll understand that your salvation, the saving of your soul, is not a cooperative effort. It's not because you are a good person and you have done this and you have upheld your end of the bargain. It's not God helps those who help themselves. It's God taking on all of it, all of the consequences. This all-powerful God, intimate, caring, loving, and personal, is now sacrificially engaged. And when Jesus came, Jesus said this, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard this. Jesus said that he is the fulfillment of the old covenant. Wow, now that makes sense. Because this old covenant, to be fulfilled, if either party broke it, God had to die. And humankind destroyed their end of this covenant. And God came to earth and fulfilled that covenant. That covenant is done. It was fulfilled. Time for a new covenant. Which is what Jesus did on the cross. And once again, not asking us to do anything other than you will be my God. Because to, he didn't ask us to walk the gauntlet. He didn't, didn't, didn't ask us to spill his blood. He didn't ask us to walk that covenant again. God completely picks up the check again. This is that awesome, amazing, all-powerful God reaching out to you and me personally, intimately, lovingly, sacrificially, so that you might have life. He says, if you don't keep your end of the bargain, I will be your God. Then I, myself, God, will cover the consequences. God is more awesome than we can imagine. So powerful, so sovereign, and yet so personal, caring, watching, engaged, intimate, and full of grace. I think I've said that 25 times this morning. I hope you go away with that. God did not create the world and spin it and sit back in his lawn chair with his iced tea. God is active and involved, and he knows. Now, last week, uh, at, at this point, I played a song for you on video. This week, I asked Andy to learn the song, and it's a different song. But it really, like last week, sums up everything I'm trying to say. The other thing that happened with this new covenant is that for the first time ever, God doesn't live other than people and watching over people. God actually says that he will live inside you. So think about this as Andy sings this. This amazing God, the creator of everything, all-powerful, all-knowing, who could be anywhere he wants to be, chooses to live inside of you. If you don't know about this new covenant, it's a lot different. The old covenant was on law, in right and wrong and do and don't and earning your way. It was impossible, but every page of the Old Testament with a life in that old covenant pointed to Jesus because Jesus changed the whole deal. When he died on the cross for you, for me, he paid the price. It's paid for and done and, and, and in a sense, going way back to the beginning, the covenant was, I will provide salvation for the world, and that's what he did. The other parts of that are really simple. I will be your God, and you will be my people. But what does that mean? What is your God? Who is your God? I can say honestly, for a long time of my life, my car was my God. Is there anything in our life that we have in higher place, in higher priority of God? Do we listen to him? Do we do what he says? Does he call the shots in our life? Jesus has paid the price that we might have life and to know him and set up this new covenant sealed in his blood. Let's pray together. 
Lord Jesus, thank you for what you have done. As you came to earth to fulfill the old covenant, to establish a new covenant, a kingdom of peace. In beautiful relationship with the creator, the God of the universe. Thank you. Thank you. We are humbled. God, may we live in a way that honors you, aligns with you, surrendered to you, in a way that pleases you, not because uh, we have to keep the right and wrong. We want to live in a way that pleases you because of your love, because you loved us so much that we respond to you and we live for you. And God, this morning I pray that for wherever we are, for each of us in this room, uh, engaged in that in all, maybe all kinds of different ways and different levels, God, I pray that we would know you and become more and more like Jesus and that you would change our world through that. But God, even today, may we know you more. In Jesus' name, amen.